Dada jumping on Kef and Dravid following suit. The celebrations that followed that victory were a scene to behold. Apparently, when India was on 146 for 5, some from the English team had asked for champagne to be put on ice. And now, after the victory, the Indian players demanded the Englishman to hand the champagne over. Now, even though those bottles didn't come, others did, with Ravi Shastri coming down from the commentary box to open up the first. After a couple of hours, as the team made their way to the bus, Indian fans had clogged the main road surrounding Lords, waving the Indian flag, cheering their team on. An emotional Dada stood up from his seat and thanked his team for this glorious victory while also announcing the bonus BCC had declared back home. While Dravid, he once again quietly tried to retire from his wicket keeping duties, also wishing that the bonus be equally divided among all the players and the coaching staff. As the team reached the hotel, it too was completely surrounded by crowds. The staff greeting them with champagnes and laddus, marking the start of the second party that would go well into the night. It was a glorious occasion for the team, the fans, and the nation alike. And as they rejoiced in this historic moment, all of them were completely unaware of the storm that was heading their way. An hour and a half ago, we had a 146 for five. And we're walking off this field losing. And you're, you're literally thinking about that while you're shaking hands. And you're doing all the pleasantries and you'll go up to Kaif and you'll go up to the Indian team and you're looking up at Saurav and you're not, that doesn't bother you. All that bothers you is an hour and a half ago, we had the Fab Five out and we were winning the NatWest Trophy final and we've now lost again. How did this happen? You are completely blank. You're in a zone, but in a very bad zone. You're in an immediate place of, how did we lose that game? And you know that will, you, as, because you're a captain that cares, you know you'll care about that for the rest of your life. I saw 11 England cricketers caring deeply uh, and I saw 11 cricketers in the dressing room absolutely distraught with losing that game. A distraught English team and a despairing captain were sitting in their hotel rooms, starting what might have been one of the longest nights of their lives. But by the time the night ended, they only had one thing on their mind. The same thing that had been on flint of mind for the past few years. Payback. Nobody had bothered to say it out loud, but for everybody present, their actions spoke louder than words. Actions that would be aptly described years after in Nasir Hussain's autobiography. I didn't do enough. So, even after losing multiple people to injuries, even with Flintoff complaining of serious groin pain, the entire team had gone down to practice within days of that loss. To practice and to plan. To plan so as to ensure that this time, India would have nowhere to escape. Starting from reviving the plan that had targeted India's heart, Sachin. Last year when they were touring India, Nasir Hussain had come up with a plan. Give up on getting Sachin out directly. Make left arm spinner Ashley Giles ball over the wicket and pitch the ball way outside the leg stump. Given the low scoring options for a ball ball there, you could somehow stifle and frustrate Sachin into playing a bad shot. Now whether the plan worked or not, uh, that was up for debate. Yes, Giles did manage to get Sachin stumped for the first time in his career. But Sachin had still managed to become the player of the series back then. But now, to make sure that he tried everything in his power, he quickly brought the plan back, giving Giles a single objective for the rest of the series. Make Sachin's life miserable. And just like this, multiple plans were created. Seva could be baited into giving his wicket, Dada could be angered into. Line and length chart on for each and every batsman, worked and reworked till utter perfection. Hussein seeming to be banking on one single fact. You think we are under pressure as England cricketers, Wardy? Nothing. Yeah. In Indian cricketers, if you lose a game, every single TV channel has you on and there's votes, should Ganguly go, should Tendulkar go, you know, they are, they are as bad as anyone that if they lose, they will hammer you. So I always knew that the pressure would shift if we could get ahead. Now at least he wasn't wrong about the expectations from the fans. Everybody had set their eyes on yet another historic milestone, completely ignoring the fact that India's test record in England was played 41, won 3 and lost 22. Tests in England had been India's been since long past. Its track record there even worse than in Australia at that time. And so, according to Hussein, all they had to do was get ahead. And talking about getting ahead, surely it had to be coincidence that the one practice test match which India was going to get against an English team, the only place where they could get set on the rhythm of an English test, that match had a pitch so bad, with a bounce so uneven, with chances of getting injured so high, 
that India was said to be considering just not coming out in the second inning. So as the sun rose on the first day of the Lords, we had the victorious with the hopes and expectations of a nation riding on them without any proper match practice before the test match. And then we had the vanquished with their pleads and plans just ready to pounce on some throats. And so started the test series that was soon to be recorded in the annals of cricket history. The first battleground? Well, it wasn't much to talk about. Mostly dry with some spots of life here and there. So the plan for England was very simple. Win the toss, elect to bat and see off the first few sessions defensively. Historically, this pitch would get easier to bat as time went on, allowing them to put early pressure on India along with making them bat on the last day of the test. So, as the English captain made his way to the crease after losing two early wickets, he had only one thing on his mind. Defence, defence and defence. Save wickets at all costs. So he came and hunkered down. Back to the ball only and only if you have to. The rest, straight to the keeper. Such was the captain's resolve that his first 60 runs would take more than 60 overs. And things would have just continued in the same vein. If not for the cramp. Captain Nasir Hussain suddenly started having severe cramps. Neither the physio nor the stretches were helping and seeing the Indian Pacers circling in for the kill, Nasir made a simple decision. Rather than defend demurely till the inimitable, why not go on the offence? At least he can score some runs that way. And this one decision, it could later be described as the turning point of this match. Because suddenly, the same player who had taken 128 balls to score 50 runs, he would complete his century in the next 64 balls. Such was the fury of that onslaught that a pitch that had seemed to be full of demons before, it now seemed like a child's playground. And watching the captain set the tone, his entire team would dance to the beat. Flint of 59, White 53, Crawley 64, Jones 44 and the cramp ridden distraught captain 155. Together all of them taking England to 487 runs in just one and a half day of play. So by this point, one thing had become very clear. There were only two ways to get out on this pitch. Either the baller would do something incredibly brilliant or the batsman would do something incredibly foolish. And in the match that was to come, both of the scripts were to be followed word for word. In response to an initial walloping from Sehwag, the English ballers fell back to their plan. Ball on the right spot, ball after ball, over after over. The entire first hour of day three had just two loose balls on offer, both of which were dispatched to the boundary. Together, the English bowling lineup had made scoring as difficult as it could be on a pitch like this. And along with this controlled bowling came an uncontrolled aggression. What was mostly Flintoff's job before this? It had now become a team sport. It was as if two games were being played at once. Who could get a wicket and who could get the batsman angry? In time, the antics and the discipline would start paying dividends. Seva got out on 84 on what could be described as a moment of bad luck. Dravid out on the first ball to misbehave on an otherwise perfect pitch. While Sachin, he fell to the plan that was set up for him from the very first ball. Kyle's leg trap, frustration, unnecessarily trying to go after a ball and out. And then, as if following the slogan, whatever Sachin could do, we can do worse. The entire team collapsed to some truly reprehensible shots. On a day where just close by, India had won the gold medal in the Commonwealth Games for shooting. The Indian batting in commiseration had decided to shoot themselves in the foot. Going from 128 for 2 to 221 all out in just 50 overs. Within 10 days of that victory, Dada was sitting now on the same spot, on the same balcony. But this time, facing a humiliating follow-on. Now, well, thankfully, the English captain refused to deter from his plan. He decided to pad up again, starting to what just seemed like a repeat telecast of the first inning. England hitting a total of 300 runs in just 65 overs. A final target of 567 runs. India in response, well, they too started a repeat telecast, losing 6 wickets for 170 runs. So, one and a half day to go. Four wickets left. That's Lakshman along with three ballers. Frankly, for all intended purposes, the game was over. The match was done. Everybody knew it. The only question that now remained was how humiliating it was going to be. Exactly how badly would they defeat India on the very spot of their glory? And as the English team got about to answering that question, something weird started happening. Now, cricket, by its very nature, is a game of unpredictables and unforeseen. And yet, what happened next? It was so weird that no player on that pitch 
no journalist in the audience and no fan in their home could have dreamt of it in a million years a bowling lineup that had easily taken out the greatest batting lineup in the world suddenly couldn't do anything about agarkar ajit agarkar having a batting average of 7.81 agarkar known for his habits of getting ducks agarkar who first with lakshman and then by himself cut the entire english bowling apart yes cut them apart after playing the first 35 balls defensively he quickly realized and this wasn't going to work he wouldn't survive that way so with no hopes of actually saving the test agarkar came up with the exact same plan that the english captain had employed a few days back don't defend demurely attack attack and attack so he did specifically on the english pacers Working from his own experience, he just tried to judge the ball, going after them whenever they were there to be hit. The result: sixteen fours, sixteen. A match that should have ended on day four suddenly was being pulled up to the lunch. What was to be a three hundred and ninety-seven runs defeat, the greatest margin of defeat against any team by that point, whenever four innings were played. It was now just one hundred and seventy runs. And yes, wickets kept on falling on the other end. Yes, India did lose the match. But as the English team started celebrating their victory, the smiles on their faces were a bit muted because there, walking along them, was Ajit Agarkar, standing not out on 109 runs. It wasn't as bad as it could be, but a loss was still a loss. India had been outmatched, outplanned, and frankly outplayed throughout the course of this match. And given the hopes that the public had with them, the backlash was biblical. from being two lakhs to being too full of themselves anything and everything was brought into question and as the indian team was taking this blows left right and center the defeat had proved one thing above all morale and momentum would mean nothing in front of this gigantic monster especially given the fact that kumle along with wicketkeeper ajay ratra were now injured hence sachin would later go on to say in his autobiography we all knew we needed to be more competitive in the next match if we were to stay alive in the series a bruised and beaten india had to somehow find a way to weather this on rushing storm the interesting thing was dada seemingly prophetically had already put a change in motion a change that would be so momentous that it would change the very shape of indian batting for years to come it would change the attitude with which they were viewed it would change the fate of a player who might have otherwise doomed to have disappeared in obscurity we cover the story of that change and the next test in our next video i hope you enjoyed this video and i hope you have a good day thank you for watching